Over the last few weeks, what we've done is we have heard about understanding our world and we've heard that there is a, a huge dissonance and getting bigger between how the world functions and operates and how we do. And there's an understanding that you and I have that's different in our world. And we've you know, said, hey, listen, there's a third way to this. Uh, there's the way, you know, the way the world runs. And uh, God, but God says, I have a, a biblical way. I have the way that, that you, can, you can think about your world. I want to take us just a little bit off of that and say, listen, in our world that we have, even though it's very opposite of the way you think and how you, how you function, you can still be effective and you can still change your world. Because if you think about how Jesus functioned in his world, his world is not a lot different than ours. But he always kind of came along into situations and he would see things that nobody else saw. Do you notice that? He would come and he'd be uh, going to ministering to people and these kids would come running toward him and all the adults would do what? Just push them, like this is going to be the audience response part. I know you're an hour less, but what did Jesus do with the people? The kids. He said, come to me. And he said, hey, listen, these kids, there's something you can learn from them to understand what it is, how you need to function in the world. And there was a rich man that came to him and uh, everybody would have looked at that rich man and would have thought, you know, he's a pretty good example of how life should function, what it should be like, and everybody be good. But Jesus looked at him, and he saw that this man was absolutely bound by his money, and he was never going to have joy or peace or fulfillment. And he looked at him, and he loved him, and it's the only time he ever said it to anybody. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take everything, everything that you own and come and follow me. He was wanting him to be a fully committed follower, a disciple. And it says, and the man walked away, very sad. Jesus saw something that nobody else saw. There was a lady, every time I, I read this story or hear this story, I, I uh, <laughs> kind of go, oh, okay. Um, so there's a lady, Jesus is, probably lounging down and eating because that's how they did it. And she came and she started crying and her tears were kind of pouring all over his feet. And as she was crying, she was taking her hair, she undid her hair and her hair came flowing down and she's wiping down his feet. Got the picture? Completely inappropriate, right? Everybody around would have been going, ah! Really, they would have been, because this was like, this was not what was supposed to happen. And they would have thought, over emotional, completely inappropriate woman. Was that true? Yeah, it was. Yeah, that was actually what was happening there. But Jesus looked and he saw somebody who was giving everything. And he said, you know what, if you get this, in, in this situation, you'll understand that you, this woman got grace and she got forgiveness in a way that probably most of you are never going to get it. So if you're going to be, have an impact in your world, here's what I want to talk to you about today. You need to begin to see your world like Jesus saw his world. There's gold out there. This is the picture that I'm using. There's gold out there and the, uh, everywhere, but our world looks like black and blue. It looks like a place where we would fight. You need eyes. Like Now, you're not going to get this perfectly like Jesus did, but we need to see the people in our world differently than what's going on in the surface. So and in, I'm going to read you a scripture. And we're going to talk about how do, how do we do that. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, don't you have a saying? And this, it's still four months until harvest, but I tell you, open your eyes. Say open your eyes. And look at the fields, for they are ripe. With harvest. Now, if we would be talking in our culture right now, we have lots of grain around. This would be Jesus looking around over a wheat field 
and he would say, look at the fields. And there's two fields that you could see here. He would say, look at the field, and, and he's looking at the right one. He says, and the fields are ripe for harvest. And you would say, no, they're supposed to be like that. That's what ripe for harvest looks like, the one on the left, right? He says, four months now, and so I want you to get the picture. He's standing with his disciples, looking at this green field, and he says, look, it's ripe. Now, I, I got this picture. This is the tulips that are growing in the Netherlands. Yes. Love when plant comes together. Isn't that like crazy? That's amazing. And all of those are tulips. And you look at that field and you go, it's ripe. And you, and, but Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're not supposed to be looking for that stuff. You actually have to look deeper in your life and you have to understand that there is something going on beneath the surface. And you look at the people around you and you say, there is gold there. But you're going to need different eyes to see it. You're going to need the kind of eyes that Jesus had because our world is not a gold world. Our world is black and blue. So you're going to take a look and you're going to see what that looks like. So here are a few ways that we're going to do that. I'm going to walk you through. The first way we're going to have, you know, is going to be a little bit lighter. And I want you to think of it this way. If we're going to see our world the way Jesus saw his world, we need to get not be sidetracked by things that are distractions. We need to not be sidetracked things that aren't central in our lives. And, and if you're a Shrek fan, you will totally get this. You and I are on a quest, and if we are completely capable of being sidetracked by good things or things that are happening around our world. So I'm going to think of it this way, and I'm going to give you colors, and this is like the audience participation part of this message, okay? I'm going to give you a color, and I want you to think about what does this represent in how we can get sidetracked in our world? Take a look at the first one. Okay. We all know what color this is. What, what does that color represent? Uh, love. Oh, yeah, that, that's like a very, that's because you have a pure heart, and that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm looking for the not good. <laughs> Anger, yes. And if, we, and if you live through the pandemic, you will know that. This is what happens to us. And some of you are still angry, right? No, don't answer that. You can take the red down. Some of you, this is, this is the part of the distraction that happens in our life. There are things that we have that can annoy us and we can get frustrated because our world is not like it should be. And what happens is the enemy actually uses that because you're actually right. Our world isn't the way it should be. And there are things that are absolutely wrong, but he uses that to keep you distracted in your life. And what are you thinking about? The things that aren't right. True? And it bubbles up inside of you. And rather than the core thing that's what's important, you begin to think about that thing. And you end up in crazy places. Take a look at the screen. I found this monkey. It doesn't matter what you think of me. My friends inside my head think I'm special. And we do. <laughs> All of us end up, if we allow that part to flow through in our lives, we end up in places that really are just a distraction to us. Next color is this. Purple. Kind of like success or good things or money and being able to do this. That in itself is not a bad thing. But if that's the core, if that's what you're pursuing, as your first thing, it ends up being a, a distraction from what God would want you to do. And it really allows you uh, to not be able to have the kind of focus that we have because what it does is it puts the focus on me and the things that I want to do. And we begin to not see ourselves or we begin to see ourselves too big. Now, if you're a friends person, I told you this is going to be a light section. Yeah, if you know this, it's, there's a scene where Joey says, yeah, I am pretty wisdomous. 
and we begin to think about ourselves in ways that are completely disproportional to what we think of because what we've done is we have thought about who we are. And we thought about, and our world becomes focused on that. Next one is green, which is kind of like envy. And, and the distraction in this is the thing that is probably what we see in our world. You may not be completely focused like this, but we see in our world over and over again is comparison. I compare myself to you, I comp or, or even worse, I compare myself to your best moments, your Facebook moments, and my life begins to look a certain way. And as you do that, what happens in your life is you're comparing people, is you all, everything begins to sink. And you lose focus on what's important. And, and I don't, actually it doesn't matter how old you are, or what you've experienced, this can happen to you anytime. I had a friend come up to me and said, you know what, I know I shouldn't do this, but I walked into my friend's house and I've spent my whole life in ministry and I looked at their house and I thought, I have wasted my life. <laughs> he says, I know this is a terrible thought and I know I'm probably going to hell. No, you're not going to hell. But it happens to us, right? Is we compare ourselves with each other and we lose focus, and we don't see what's really important. Last one is this. Black. Is all of us get in negativity in our lives, where we begin to see the things seem dark. And you don't quite be able to see your way out of it. And if you're kind of more of a feeler person, you absolutely know this is true. And, and there's a, a growing up that needs to happen in this. I, I, I had a friend, Paul, I'm gonna use you for this if that's okay. Had a friend who about 10 years ago said, you know what, the turning point in my life was that I went to church one day and I just decided I was gonna go to church and I wasn't gonna talk to anybody or approach anybody. I was just gonna see how many people came and talked to me? And so let's say Paul was that guy. He would never be that guy. He's like hugging everybody that comes around. <laughs> and so he says, you know what? And he's talking, he says, you know what I did? Nobody came and talked to me. Not one person said hi to me. This is a terrible church. And I love his, I love his friend. Because he's a mature guy. This is what he did. They always hate it when I go down here because the camera doesn't work, but it's going to work like great. The guy looked at him and he said, you know what? Here's my question. Here's my thought to you. Grow up! Right? Seriously? That's what you're going to do? He says, how much has been poured into you? How many sermons have you heard? How much time has God spoken into your life? How many uh, podcasts have you heard? How much in your prayer time has God given you things over and over and over again? Really? <laughs> Some of you are going, that seems a little harsh. You know why? Because he's mature. That's what you do to somebody who's mature sometimes, and you're, they're acting like they're immature, because if you don't, the darkness takes over their life. And sometimes, what happens in our life is we need somebody to go like that. And I pick Paul because he's one of those guys, right? Make it happen. What are you going to do? Here's the distraction that happens. You can find yourself in all sorts of places emotionally that tie you up and they aren't the truth. Did nobody say hi to him this morning? Yes. Is that important? No! Because you know why he's in church? To give. Is that true? Because if you are mature, you understand that your life is not centered around what you get. Of course you get stuff when you come here, but you actually come into your world to give to people. And if you find yourself in that place where it's turned around, you understand that you need a different perspective. So whether it's red or green or black, 
God says, you know what, I have something better for you that you need to have eyes to see. The second thing that I want to encourage you in is this. If you're going to see like Jesus did, you need to begin to be, live your life in a way that you're open to the supernatural coming into as a part of who you really are. For most of us, this is kind of difficult, right? Because... Every time you pray, something happens, but you don't necessarily see that something is happening. So when you're walking and doing your regular life as a Christian, we can just get used to walking, and we forget that we have the resources of heaven in our life. I I teach uh, at AMP, which is kind of our our network of churches. We get these group of volunteer, uh, younger people together, and they're sort of the mentees. And and what I do with them, we talk about gifts. And then I get them together and I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have people who, whoever has sort of like a really bad tangible thing in their health that's not great, I want you to come up. And I'm not gonna pray for them because then it's somebody else. I want you to pray for these people whoever it is. And so all these ampies, these young, young mentees come up and they pray for whatever it is that's ailing this person. Here's what I want you to understand. Every time, every time I've done this, the people have gotten healed. Yes. Thank you, Lord. First of all, Hey guys, why do you think that is? Why do you think, because it doesn't happen every time to me. I've prayed over hundreds of people who haven't been healed, right? And you've tried stuff that has, sometimes you would think, huh, didn't work. That's not the right thinking, but you get that. Why do you think this would happen with these young mentees? Because God wanted to show them that actually that is the truth and it's what you and I walk in when he chooses to do this and to make this happen. You have the ability to incorporate the supernatural into your life and in fact it opens up a whole avenue to the people around you that would never be opened up ever in any situation. And God is constantly at work in us to say, you have the ability to incorporate the supernatural into your life. Your job is to step out, part one. Part two, not make it about you. Because if you make it about you, there's a little bit of a theme happening here. Did you get this? If you make it about you, you're probably not gonna step out. I have a scripture a story that is is kind of interesting that I'm going to read for you. It's from Acts chapter 13. Elymas the sorcerer, that's what his name means, was opposing Paul and Barnabas, who were on sort of their first mission journey. And he tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. And the story is basically that Paul and Barnabas were, God wanted this guy, this proconsul, to experience Jesus and this Elymas, the sorcerer, was trying to push them away. They were in a world, they were in a conflict, they were in a situation where it didn't appear like things would go well. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked straight at Elymas, and he said, are you ready for this? You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, and you, will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you, and you're going to be blind for a time and not even able to be the light, uh, see the light of the sun. And immediately mist and darkness fell over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now, here's the, here's the sentence that I want you to get. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he, he saw first, and then it says he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. You would think that sentence would end, he was amazed at the stuff that happened, right? That this guy got struck blind. Isn't that how it would normally end? He said, no. See, here's the the key that I want you to get. I don't want you to go around praying over people that they would become blind. That's not the point of this story. What I want you to get is your 
supernatural that you walk in is actually a key to help people understanding who Jesus really is. God uses it all through the, if you look at all through the New Testament, you see in Jesus' life and in the life of the apostles, there is a way that you walk in the supernatural that actually is going to open up a world that is hostile, that's black and blue toward the gospel, and it's going to help you see the gold in people. And God has given you the ability to walk in that. I would say most of us don't live a life anticipating the supernatural. Most of us. Some of us do, right? Is that fair? Kind of live your life, do your thing. You sort of hope that it happens. One of the ways that God taught me this was early, early on, I was in um, a Mennonite church where that was not sort of the norm. And, and we were in a, a really, really tough situation where there were two stories that were coming out and it needed to be dealt with in order for the church to move forward because it was some really terrible um, claims that were coming out. And I remember sitting beside my neighbor who was the moderator of the church and we were sitting around the table and, and you know, the Bible doesn't say God will give you the ability to be a great detective to figure things out, right? But it does say that you have access to the supernatural. So we were sitting around this table and we said, God, we are so confused. We have no idea what to do. Would you please help us? And it was a genuine prayer because we knew that we were in trouble as leaders of the church. And what happened was, he, we kind of went our way. We didn't have any grand spiritual moment at the time. He uh, went back, laid down, and he had a dream that night like he'd never had before. And he saw this gentleman who um, presented as Santa Claus. He was like the nicest guy and kind and gentle. He saw that he had two faces. One was the face of Santa Claus, this nice, kind, gentle girl, And the other was actually a demonic face that was lashing out. And he came to me and he said, you know what, I think we have our answer because this is what God showed me in a dream last night. Because when you pray, God comes and he makes a difference. You and I walk in the supernatural. If we make it about ourselves, we'll probably never get there because you can step out sometimes and it might not happen the way you want it to happen and you can shrink back. You can believe for something sometimes and it doesn't happen and it might even be really hard. But all of those things are actually making it about yourself and God said, I want you to see that I have people around you that are only going to believe if they see the supernatural come and you have the ability to walk in that. It's yours. Step out. Because God is going to meet you in those places and you are going to be able to see the gold that is there. There's a, a generosity that saves us from cynicism that is is really important for us to move into. Because if we're gonna see, and especially as we get older, we, we, we sometimes have this thought that as we get older, there's some things that we put behind. And um, I, I want you to put up the, the picture, guys, of, of the, uh, the, the, the skinny jeans and the dog in the skinny jeans. This is sort of what happens. <laughs> there, we, we begin to think, ah, you know, I'm sorry, isn't that like way too much? <laughs> and super funny at the same time. Uh, there, there are some things that we think, ah, you know what, I kind of grow out of this. And, and we learn to live our life in such a way that cynicism begins to creep into our life. And if, if we become cynical, it actually blocks our ability to see people, to see the gold in who they are, to see the situations as they are. I, I remember talking to somebody who was really close, and uh, after the pandemic, they said, you know what, Ob, if I never go to church again, um, that'll kind of be okay. I've sort of gotten used to this online thing. Um, I've been in small groups all my life. I've, you know, helped run the church board. I've done, I've done all the stuff, and I'm kind of done. And, and so I could have gone and said, grow up! What is it? That, that, that would seem like a good answer to that question, right? 
But, but God looks at everybody individually, and because the Holy Spirit lives in you, you actually have the ability to give Holy Spirit wisdom to people, not your best thought. Because your best thought, probably not helpful. Right? You are a product of the Holy Spirit. And so I just remember thinking, oh man, that seems really bad. And the, the thought that popped into my mind was this. He's actually a father, and he's not fathering anybody. <clears throat> so I said to him, and I'm going to have to apologize to his pastor, I'm pretty sure. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to quit everything that you're doing in church, and I want you to start being a dad. And he went, oh. He said, this, your church is full of people, young guys, who, who need what you have. Nobody has come to these young guys. They don't have dads. Nobody has come and put their hand on their shoulder and just said, hey, you know what? This is what it's like to struggle. Nobody's come and sat down with them and really listened to what they're going through. And you're going to be an amazing dad. You and your wife are going to be like mom and dad. And, and you can actually do that when you're doing ministry too. But it, for him, it was sort of the best thing. He, had, he was so done. And I, I came and visited him. I think just a few months later, and, and uh, this was not a church where they were, and I was coming to just connect in, and everybody knew this guy as I talked to him. You know why? Because he stopped doing what he was supposed to do, and he started doing what he was designed to do. So here's my challenge to you, especially if you're older, especially if you've had a bunch of stuff put into you, especially if you've heard a million sermons, especially if you've had stuff poured over you endlessly over and over again. You are a father and a mother. And there are people all through this church who are desperately waiting for somebody to put their hand on their, sh on your sh their shoulder. And you have... You, can, you have a path of cynicism or a path of, of being a father or a mother to the people around. And it takes a little bit of time. And it takes stepping out. And it takes being a little uncomfortable to learn how to do it. But you can have eyes to see the next generation in a whole different way. I got a prophecy two weeks ago that said, you know what, Aubrey, you're going to do blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, there you go. And he says, here's, what, here's, your, here's your thing. You're going to be really effective working with 12 to 15-year-olds. And I thought, huh. And those of you who know me could laugh because, you know, sometimes I've said, and I've, I've maybe regretted saying, that, you know, when you're in junior high, you kind of lose your mind and you have brain damage. I thought, probably I shouldn't say that to the church, right? That's probably not helpful. And God said to me, huh, I'm going to give you different eyes to see. And all of a sudden, I begin to look around and I realize, okay, God, if that's your deal for me, I want to step into that. I want to see something different than I've ever seen before. What do you see? What do you see when you look around at the people? Maybe even people you have never thought of before in your life. Some of you know this story, but it, it is sort of a life thing for Eileen and I. When she grew up in a family that didn't have a Christian influence, she, uh, her, her family lineage is Métis, and there was a lot of uh, heartache that came from that family destructiveness. And uh, as she grew, Eileen grew up in her home, uh, there, was a, there was a whole bunch of stuff that was happening that was tough and alcoholism and, and things like that that were really wrecking the family. But one day there was a lady who was older and just was a real prayer warrior. Her name was Mrs. Gould. And Mrs. Gould would pray often for the people around and she had no focus. And she was praying, God, would you give me a focus to my prayer? It just seems like I'm praying. And God gave her a picture of Jesus walking down Eileen's laneway. And so you know what she did? Because she had eyes to see, she walked down Eileen's laneway, my wife. At that point, she was this high, 
and her mom was in big trouble and her dad was always gone. And she walked down that laneway and she shared Jesus with them. Now they didn't accept it right at that point. That was, but it began a relationship that ended up being a lifelong thing that affected not only Eileen's mom's generation, but the parents above and the kids below. And so four, I have seen four generations changed because one lady had eyes to see and walked down a laneway and, and literally four generations came to the place where they began to see that God was who he says he was. Isn't that a great story? And that's our story of what happens when you begin to see. God, would you open our eyes? It starts with us taking our eyes off of ourselves and saying there's a sweetness to surrender when we say, God, help me to see the gold and not the black and blue. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? You can give the Lord a hand, sure. If you wouldn't mind bowing your heads and closing your eyes. I want to take a moment like we do after every service, online or in person, if you have never given Jesus leadership of your life, or maybe you have and you slipped away. Without anybody looking around, would you raise your hand online? Would you can raise your hand, see that hand too? Anybody here in the building that want to do that? Yep, thank you in the back. Anybody else? Um, I, I feel like God is um, saying right now that uh, there are people who have popped into your minds who need Jesus and, and just even in this moment, would you take a minute to just present them to him? Because your prayers in this moment are significant for that person. They may not, they may not even be in the building or watching. Online, if there's a hand, you can push on that. So here's what I want you to do. We're all gonna pray together. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, would you just pray along with me especially and just we're going to make this a declaration, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I give you leadership of my life. I thank you that you give me new eyes to see. Not just who you are, but who the people are around me. I thank you for times, opportunities, for supernatural times where I can make a difference in my world. Thank you for eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. There, give the Lord one more hand.